to play, to work, to visit, to breathe. Now is not the time to give up. We are stronger than this virus. When it's your turn, roll up your sleeve and stick it to COVID. What I miss is uh, hey, being out there, coming uh, through the gate so and getting ready to play. To join us today. I missed uh, uh, the uh, noise. Minister of Health, Paul Merriman, as well as Saskatchewan's Chief Medical Health Officer, Dr. Saqib Shahab, and SHA CEO, Scott Livingstone. Uh, and today we're joined by Dean as our interpreter from Sask Deaf and Hard of Hearing. Uh, we'll have opening remarks from Minister Merriman, as well as Dr. Shahab, then we'll go into questions. Uh, if I could just ask everyone to please mute your audio as well as your video. And when it comes time to questions, just hit the raise your hand function and I will call on you to ask your question. Minister Merriman, you can go ahead. Thanks, Matt. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today. It is now extremely clear that vaccines are slowing the spread of COVID in our province, reducing hospitalizations and saving lives. As our vaccination numbers go up, our case numbers go down. We have now administered over 850,000 shots in Saskatchewan. More than 672,000 people have received their first shot, and more than 143,000 have received their second shot and are now fully vaccinated. Our seven-day average of new cases is at its lowest level in seven months since early November of 2020. It's down nearly two-thirds from the third wave peak in April. In fact, it's down almost 30% in just the last week alone. Vaccines are working. They are reducing the spread of COVID, and more importantly, they are reducing the number of severe outcomes. In just a moment, Dr. Shahab is gonna present some information about cases and hospitalizations in the month of May. I'll let him give the details but you will see that the overwhelming majority of people who contracted COVID in May or who ended up in hospital had not been vaccinated. I don't know the reasons for each of these individuals not getting vaccinated. In May, not everyone had the chance to be vaccinated, but you now, you sure do. Everyone over the age of 12 has now had the chance to get their first shot. And very soon, we will all have the chance to get our second shot and be fully vaccinated. This will greatly reduce the chance that you will contract COVID-19 and pass it along to others. And if you do get COVID, chances are that you will have very mild symptoms or no symptoms at all if you are fully vaccinated. So once again, I would just ask everyone to do this one simple thing to protect yourself protect the people around you and make Saskatchewan safer so we can reopen and get back to normal. As of today, 68% of all Saskatchewan adults and 65% of all eligible residents age 12 and older have now received their first dose. Of course, we need to reach 70% to get to that last step of a reopening roadmap and remove all remaining restrictions and public health orders, but we're not there yet. And when we do open up fully, those who have chosen not to get vaccinated will still be at risk. So please, if you haven't done so already, get yourself vaccinated. There are plenty of places to go. You can go to the drive-through, walk-in, you can book your appointment at the pharmacy or the SHA clinic or you can go with Indigenous Services Canada on or off reserve. And if you're a student, we will be likely vaccinating you in your school very soon. In fact, there will be school vaccination clinics in over 70 communities across the province this week. I also wanted to mention that tomorrow, due to declining rates of COVID infections in Saskatoon, 
all three Saskatoon hospitals will move from level two to level one family presence. This means that all patients can designate two essential family or support persons to provide in-person support. Only one designated person can be at the patient at one time. This is more than one. This is one more step in getting back to normal that we were able to take because so many Saskatchewan people are getting their shot. So thanks again to everyone who's giving the vaccinations and thanks to everyone who is getting the vaccinations. Let's keep going. Please keep the following public health and orders that are still in place. If you haven't done so already, go get your first shot. Then when it's your turn, go get your second shot. Let's stick it to COVID and have a great summer, Saskatchewan. Dr. Shahab. Thank you, Minister. So uh, I'll begin by expressing my sympathies to the friend, families and friends of the 11 Saskatchewan residents who have passed away as a result of COVID since our last briefing on June the 1st. Um, and um, as the vaccination program continues, I'll be providing some additional information, as the Minister mentioned, on people who have been vaccinated uh, with a reminder that while no vaccine is 100% effective, and while the information we're looking at right now is for single dose only, it does continue to show that even a single dose provides good protection. But of course, we also have to focus and finish with second doses uh, as soon as we uh, become eligible. And together with public health measures, uh, vaccinations are now pushing our case numbers to uh, lower and lower levels. That is allowing us to, uh, in a systematic way, reopen. We're in step one now and uh, on track to enter step two, June 20th. And hopefully with an increase in vaccine, vaccine va first doses, 18 and over, step three. And then uh, once we hit that 70% mark, 12 and over, uh, we can look at uh, removing other public health restrictions as part of step three. So I just show you some uh, information that is also posted online uh, on, um, uh, we, I, I did, we did share some initial breakthrough data and uh, now I'm just sharing some further data from the month of uh, May and we will be bringing this data back in more detail um, uh, on a monthly basis. So as you can see, um, we at the moment are measuring uh, the effect of vaccinations 21 days after the first dose and the 21 day mark is important. Our steps are separated by 21 days because it takes up to three weeks for the first dose to start having an appreciable effect, but then that effect keeps building up uh, four weeks, five weeks and on. Um, and then when you get your second dose, uh, two weeks after your second dose is when you start seeing the optimal benefit. And, and because of that, we will continue to uh, see serious illness rates decrease as uh, residents see first, the first dose and increasingly as second doses. Um, over the month of May uh, of the 5,296 cases, the majority were in unvaccinated uh, individuals or those who had just received the COVID vaccine within the last three weeks when it, uh, we discount that vaccine because a person may have been exposed before the vaccination or right during the time they were getting vaccinated. And the vaccine in those situations obviously cannot prevent a case of COVID. Then after three weeks, we saw only 8% of cases, 427, and, and most of those would have been mild and and in many day uh, it was individuals who had comorbid medical conditions and then when we look at hospitalizations again our information is consistent with those of other provinces and the uk that the vast majority of hospitalization the month of may out of 191 due to covid were um, in people who were unvaccinated or just recently vaccinated and only 18 percent in individuals who had been vaccinated three or four week, uh, weeks ago and again, you know, it is not just COVID that brings you to hospital. Uh, and, and many of the individuals were older and had um, underlying com. Uh, Eighty-six percent were over the age of sixty, and seventy-eight percent have had underlying com uh, mobilities. And we've already seen uh, in our long-term care residents who are older and frail, um, uh, more frail, that how two doses has continued to protect them now uh, four or five months out from their two dose vaccination program as early as January and February. And that's another uh, you know, vulnerable population that we will continue to monitor over the next few months. 
In terms of ICU admissions, again, uh, very positive trends. Out of the 46 ICU admissions in May due to COVID, uh, the vast majority, 87%, were in people who are unvaccinated, and, and only 6 uh, or 13% were in those who had been vaccinated three weeks or long more. And, um, and, and most of the vaccinated individuals admitted to ICU were age 70 or older and had comorbid medical conditions. Again, these are small numbers, but as we aggregate data over the next months, we'll bring this data in a cumulative fashion and only as, as well as in a month by month fashion. And by next month, we should also be able to show the impact of second doses, which is, which is expected to be even more marked. So again, just in closing for the presentation, uh, you know, while we are in step one and completing first doses and starting second doses, at the at the present time, it remains important to continue to reduce your risk of infection, including masking in indoor public places, physically distancing, reducing close contacts and non-essential travel. Outdoors obviously is better than indoors. Uh, uh, washing hands um, after coming home. And you know, with allergy season, I think it's important to reinforce our testing rates have come down, and that if you have any symptoms that are considered COVID, do get tested because even if your symptoms are mild, uh, you know you can still transmit, and we still have, you know, about 35% of the population 12 and older who is unvaccinated. So it is important to continue to seek testing if you're symptomatic and stay home to minimize transmission as you move ahead in the vaccination program. Uh, and also abide by the public health guidelines in uh, public spaces. And of course, you know, everyone is eligible to get the vaccine now 12 and older. And then as soon as you become eligible for second dose, it is important to go quickly. Uh, that allows the vaccine's uh, second dose program to also move down the age groups uh, following the same uh, age base sequencing that has followed the first doses. But with the increasing supply, obviously the speed at which we're moving through second doses is much higher. So we, uh, first doses are continuing to be given, uh, but uh, an increasing proportion now are also second doses. That is very important as well. So with this, I'll just continue for a bit that, um, you know, we will also be looking at along with our partners uh, in the Saskatchewan Health Authority at identifying trends in vaccine uptake by geography. And uh, Mr. Livingston can speak further to uh, strategies that will be undertaken to in increase uptake because we've always said that the uh, uh, vaccine uptake depends on um, convenience. Uh, the more convenient it is, uh, the more people get it uh, as early as they uh, want to um, at a location close to the community. But we've already seen that most people will book at a pharmacy, at an SHA clinic, or go to a walk-in or drive-in. And people sometimes from large urban centers are going to rural areas and from rural areas are coming to large urban centers and all that is fine. But obviously, for the far north, there's special provisions and clinics to increase uptake, make it more convenient. Complacency is a factor that many young people have busy lives. And if you live in a rural area where you haven't seen COVID for a while, many people are putting it off that we'll get it maybe next week or the week after. And really, um, I think it is important to get it uh, if you're 12 and older, still unvaccinated at your earliest convenience and not put it off. And that allows you to then complete the second dose and this starts protecting you immediately, protects your family and the community, and also helps us move more quickly to uh, our reopening uh, mm -hmm. level step three. And then confidence, you know, we uh, think, um, you know, surveys have shown that 80 to 90 percent of the population intends to get the vaccine, and people 60 and older have shown that with the high vaccine uptake in the high 80s or 90 percent range. And, you know, while our targets are at 70 percent, I think going as high as we can at every age group can only serve us well, not just for the summer, but for the fall as well. So, you know, we all, the vast majority of people are confident in getting a vaccine, but if there's any questions that you have, uh, you know, please do talk to your healthcare provider, your pharmacist, public health. Um, you can call 811, I think, to get answers to your questions. Uh, and it remains important that we continue to get vaccinated as our key route out of uh, out of COVID. Um, with that, maybe I will just um, I, with that I, I will actually just stop because I think uh, with just the closing remark that you know vaccines continue to show a dramatic uh, impact on our COVID rates. But right now, till we uh, uh, enter step three, 
all the other public health measures remain important as well. While many of us can do so many things that we couldn't for many weeks and months, you know, we still need to observe public health measures. And people who are older have underlying risk factors. You know, if you want to wait till two weeks out of your second dose before engaging more in a social um, gathering uh, uh, during step one and step two, I think that's perfectly fine as well. You know, you know, eligibility for st uh, for a second dose is moving down quickly. Uh, 60 and older are eligible right now. So again, it's, if you uh, want to, it's best to get your second dose, wait two weeks, and then engage, and that will protect you even more um, uh, in terms of the low risk of uh, getting seriously ill with COVID. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shahab. Thank you so much, Minister Merriman. Uh, we'll now move uh, into questions. Uh, if you have a question, you can just hit the raise your hand feature at the top of your screen. And we'll start with Lynn Giesbrecht with the Leader Post. Go ahead, Lynn, if you want to unmute yourself. OK, uh, can everyone hear me now? Yep, you're good to go. Um, yeah, Saskatchewan does not have a nation leading vaccine campaign at the moment. We're sitting kind of near the bottom of the provinces for first dose uptake. Um, why is that and why are we not putting in more um, incentives like we're seeing in other provinces to continue people to get their first doses? Uh, thanks, Lynn. Uh, I'll take that one. Um, there, there's a few reasons. Uh, first of all, we've had extremely good uptake uh, in our province on first dose uh, and starting into second dose. What we decided, uh, we were one of the first provinces to move into sex second doses because we wanted to make sure that that vulnerable generation um, in the 70s, 80s and older got their second shot and were fully vaccinated. So we did have an overlap of tailing off of our first shot with uh, the 30 and under to the over overlapping of get people getting fully vaccinated, which we thought it was critically important to make sure that they had that opportunity. Some of the things that we are doing is we're engaging the universities and the post-secondaries. We're obviously engaging the schools uh, to make sure that uh, those younger people that are under the age of 40 are getting vaccinated. We've reached out to uh, newcomer communities and new Canadian associations to be able to make sure that we can get that, the information translated into uh, people's native tongues so they understand the benefits of that. We have educators on site with our clinics to make sure that if people have questions, I don't think it's a, an issue of vaccine hesitancy. I just think it's more uh, summertime. People are uh, not looking at getting vaccinated. And as Dr. Shahab indicated earlier, they uh, people are saying, oh, we'll get it done next week or the week after. We need you to get it in, get it done immediately so you can get uh, so we can start moving forward in our uh, rollout plan to uh, reopen Saskatchewan. You have a follow up question, Lynn? Um, yeah, kind of related, but we see AstraZeneca going through the drive throughs in Regina and Saskatoon. Um, Regina's had like zero lineups all day in Saskatoon a little bit in the morning and then it's really tapered off again too. Um, what kind of uptake have we seen on AstraZeneca and what happens if you end up with a bunch of it left over? Um, well, we don't think that we're going to have any leftover right now. I'll get Scott to give the exact numbers. We've actually had pretty good uptake on AstraZeneca. Uh, you have to remember when we put AstraZeneca in, in the original 15,000, we did it specifically in Regina to uh, deal with the variants of concern that were coming into Regina. But um, it is something that uh, is very important that people get their second shot. That the options have come out from NASI with Dr. Shahab's uh, support that they have an option of getting Pfizer and that. So I think people are getting their second shot. And I'm not concerned at all that we will have uh, leftover AstraZeneca. This just started this week. Uh, we're just fresh into this and we have lots of time uh, to be able to move the AstraZeneca into arms. Maybe Scott, if you can give some specific information. <clears throat> sure. Over the last couple of days in Regina, Lynn, we've administered over, well, close to 4,000 doses of AstraZeneca through the drive through and in Saskatoon, I believe they came close to two yesterday. We're going to continue to watch. Uh, I did also drive by the uh, drive through today and saw that it was quite slow. So the team is watching uptake of both at the drive throughs and walk-in clinics uh, as well for the uh, vaccine. We hope to... Uh, get more people interested in coming in for their second doses, but we also know that they're offered uh, whatever vaccine they choose to take. Uh, everybody essentially in Regina that went through the drive-through early in March is eligible this week. 
So we hope as uh, people get time, they'll come through the drive drive through, and we'll get those doses in arms. We'll take our next question from Mark Smith with CTV. Thank you. Um, at the at uh, this time, um, most regions in the province are seeing their active case counts drop, but the south central zone has almost doubled its active cases in the past two weeks. Do we have any idea what's leading to that increase and uh, what maybe, uh, you know, what's kind of spurring on that increase? Um, maybe I'll, I'll start. At, I mean, obviously our numbers are coming down and that's directly related to the vaccines. The vaccine uptake has been great across there. Um, maybe Dr. Shahab can comment specifically on that area, but overall we, the province has done a great job and I have to uh, personally thank all the people that have been out and get their shot, uh, the people again that are administering the shot, to be able to get our province back to where we want it to be and enjoy summer and enjoy things moving forward. Dr. Shahab, could you touch on that specific area? Yeah, thanks. So, you know, obviously we are watching case numbers very closely and what we have seen is obviously Regina has come down significantly. Saskatoon went up for a bit, but is down now as well. Um, but we have seen ongoing transmission at a low level. Um, trending downwards, but still continuing in that kind of su southern rural areas, you know, Moose Join area, Weyburn, Estevan, Yorkton. I think they were impacted, you know, uh, March, April with the high numbers in Regina. They also flipped from the original strain to the alpha strain, the U UK B117 strain. Um, and that continues to have a bit of an impact, but, you know, we are seeing less and less outbreaks. The outbreaks are smaller and, you know, vaccination rate is impacting uh, tra transmission in, in both um, workplaces and households. But again, it again reinforces the point. We need to get a high vaccine uptake. You know, uh, 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 Regina got a head start because of high case numbers and Regina has the highest uptake at a geographical level along with Saskatoon and, you know, some uh, rural areas throughout the province are trailing a bit. But again, uh, some of it could be demographics like more younger people in the north and far north. So, they became eligible a bit uh, later, except in the far north. In the south, you know, uh, variable population. Some communities have more young people than others. So it is variable uh, at a geographical level. But again, it reinforces uh, the complacency issue that, you know, it is important. Um, uh, the clinics are convenient, uh, widely available throughout uh, rural areas. It is important to increase uptake uniformly. And for the most part, uh, it's moving along well. But uh, but that will then continue to have exert downward pressure on case numbers, not just in the uh, south uh, central part of the province, but again, you know, we have been flagging some concerns with the north central Prince Alberton area, the northwest, um, north Battleford and Lloydminster area. We've seen not only case numbers on the higher side, but also impact through Alberta with the P1 or the um, uh, um, uh, uh, variant first identified in Brazil. Uh, so again, you know, some cautions there, but again, you know, really a, a plea that we all, all of us throughout the province, not just in these areas, the second dose as, as soon as we become eligible. Thanks. Do you have a follow-up question, Mark? Yes, um, this is on the provincial auditor's report. Uh, it said critical incidents at hospitals are going underreported or reports are being sent late to the health ministry. Um, what is the ministry going to be doing to address that and ensure and ensure prompt reporting of incidents that that happen? Uh, thanks for the question, Mark. And, and first of all, I got to thank the provincial auditor for uh, their work and uh, her work and her team's work on this. Uh, we've accepted all the recommendations that the provincial auditor has uh, put forward. Uh, there, there's a few things that we need to touch on as far as the critical incidents. First of all, we have to have the staff reporting them uh, and making sure that they identify that this is a critical incident. And then we have to uh, analyze exactly what that was, what was the error, what happened. And then we have to look at, do we need to make some policies across the board within the SHA and uh, the Saskatchewan Cancer Agency and our affiliates? Do we have to provide that? Uh, it's something that uh, the SHA is working on. 
Uh, it's something that I've been working with my ministry on, ministry officials, to make sure that that uh, end-to-end process is as smooth as possible so we can reduce any future critical incident reports. I don't know, is there anything that, Scott, you wanted to touch on on that? Thanks, Minister. Uh, Mark, I'd just like to follow up by saying, you know, Saskatchewan was one of the first, if not, I believe, the first province in the country to have critical incident legislation, which made it um, the law to report these across our healthcare system. Um, the, as you know, the critical incident process is done so that the system is a learning system and we learn from those mistakes or near misses so we can improve the quality and the safety of care moving forward. I, I also would like to thank the provincial auditor for the report and we are working both with the ministry and other health system partners uh, to expedite some of the recommendations. One of the things that the ministers touched on is the reporting process. Um, as a large organization across this province, you know, critical incident reporting is done manually. Uh, so we are looking at many options, including uh, electronic systems that would allow us not just to report critical incidents in a more timely way, but also track those near misses. So those incidents that don't cause a critical incident or harm to patients, but are learning events that can help also improve safety, uh, getting to uh, improve processes and improve quality of care before uh, there, there is an adverse event. Take our next question from Lisa Schick, CJME. Hi, um, just wondering about uh, incentives for vaccinations. Um, there's definitely been a slowdown in vaccination numbers of late and a lot of other jurisdictions are putting in incentives. So is that something the province is considering now? Would you ever consider vaccination incentives? Uh, thanks, Lisa. We have heard of the incentive programs. They seem to be very popular. We haven't seen anything that would uh, really increase that somebody has put an incentive in in a certain area that has jumped up the rates considerably. We have, an, as I mentioned before, we have an extremely good uptake here in Saskatchewan. Uh, we're ha we're, we've set the targets at 70 percent. Uh, we're going to achieve those targets. The, uh, the vaccine uh, uptake has uh, has slowed a little bit in the late, but I think there's there's many factors in that. The weather's getting nicer. Um, we're getting into a lower age demographic that is very busy, that is working. Um, we've offered incentives for people to go get vaccinated, like paid three hours off of um, off your work time. Uh, we just want to make sure, and we've also, as I mentioned before, we've also overlapped with second doses. So uh, I think our vaccine rollout is going extremely well right now. We just want to make sure that uh, that everybody has that opportunity to be able to get vaccinated. But uh, to answer your question, no, we're not looking at any incentive programs right now. Do you have a follow-up question, Lisa? Uh, yes. Um, I'm not sure what the number is today, but as of yesterday, we had gone eight straight days with more second doses happening than first doses. So I'm just wondering if that's a concern like are, that people are not getting their first doses anymore or that second doses are maybe taking the opportunity uh, away from people to get those first doses? No, I don't think so. I think that uh, there's still ample opportunity out there in the province. The SHA has opened up. We have multiple delivery systems right now versus a few months ago where we only had uh, basically the SHA was either appointments or um, drive throughs We have walk-in clinics. We have the pharmacies. We have Indigenous Services Canada engaged. We have lots of ways to get. We're just getting down to the lower numbers, and we, we do expect that it's going we did expect that this was going to slow down when we got to these lower age groups, uh, just because uh, they may not be seeing the immediate impact on themselves on this. But what they are failing to see is the impact that this could have on their family, on their community, that if they have COVID uh, and if they contract COVID, that, that that can spread even to people that are fully vaccinated. There's a very small chance of that happening. But uh, I think they're they're failing to see that this is important, not just for themselves, but also for the greater community. Then we'll take our next question from Kyle Benning with Global. Thank you. Uh, my question is for Mr. Livingston and uh, Mr. Okay. Peter chip in on this one as well. Uh, in last week's SHA Physician Town Hall, there was a presentation about peer support if doctors feel like 
they're struggling or, or need any sort of uh, mental or uh, uh, psychological help. Given the duration of how long this pandemic has been in Saskatoon and the circumstances around it, uh, can you sort of let us know about what we're hearing from doctors on the front line and and uh, I guess just their, their concern about burnout? <clears throat> Thanks, Kyle. And I, I would say, and, and you covered it then near the end of the question, is it's it's not just physicians, it's staff across uh, the SHA and, and our partners that have been working hard to both contain the virus, but also care for patients uh, as we get closer to the finish line with the vaccination program. Uh, the, the Physician Town Hall did uh, highlight some of the supports uh, that we are working to support both physicians through peer-to-peer, -peer, but also some of the mental health supports that are available both through the SMA and through the Saskatchewan Health Authority that, that go beyond some of our regular uh, employee assistant programs. We did make enhancements to mental health supports uh, throughout the pandemic for our teams, understanding that both resilience and uh, fatigue were inevitable given the number of months uh, the pandemic has been impacted. It's also a very strong component of a recovery plan uh, for the SHA as we move forward, uh, getting out of COVID soon uh, and moving forward with uh, service resumption and restarting the system. We know that the mental health of our uh, providers, both physicians and, and nurse practitioners, nurses and staff across the SHA will be critically important as we move forward uh, in, to resume services outside of COVID and ensure those folks are well taken care of. You have a follow-up question, Kyle? Yes, um, I guess just given the number of deaths, we think Dr. Schaub spoke about it in his presentation, I think 11 since June 1st. Uh, I guess, is there any concern now, even though with the the workload might be less with less people in hospital and less people in inpatient care, that uh, the number of deaths may be increasing could have a factor on mental health? Uh, maybe I'll start with that. I think that uh, the whole pandemic inside and outside the healthcare system is, has had an impact on people's mental health and everybody uh, needs to be able to take the time that uh, they need to be able to seek the help that they need to uh, to be able to uh, feel comfortable in expressing some of their stress that they have been. Uh, we've got uh, uh, two gentlemen on this call, uh, certainly Scott and Dr. Shahab, that uh, have been steady hands in making sure that everybody is is taken care of. Um, every death is a tragic death. Uh, every person that is uh, infected uh, by COVID is uh, is a challenge to that family. Everybody that is in the hospital, and uh, it just doesn't stop there. Once uh, it, it has a lasting impact on us, so we have to make sure that we're we're looking after our mental health right now but also looking at it uh, in the near future in the in the distant future to make sure that the impact of this uh, pandemic who has uh, hasn't uh, has been able to touch unfortunately everybody in our province and in our country and around the world we got to make sure that we take care of ourselves and uh, we'll, as as minister of health and uh, as dr shahab and scott i'm sure will concur we'll make sure that uh, staff within the sha and our affiliates in the sas cancer agency have access to any supports that they need uh, ongoing not just now but uh, into the future thank you and we'll take our next question from julia peterson Hi, yes, uh, I would like to uh, find out a little more about the situation with the patients, uh, pardon me, uh, and with the patients that we've been taking in from Manitoba. Um, I'd like to know uh, how many in total uh, we've taken from Manitoba and how many remain in the province. I know the daily updates have been saying uh, one in the ICU, but I believe there had been more than that to begin with. So, so to date, we've had a total of two patients that have been transferred to Saskatchewan ICUs. One has been repatriated, and we still have a single patient from Manitoba that is uh, being cared for in Saskatchewan ICU. We have uh, agreed to take patients as Manitoba needs us to, uh, as has Ontario. Ontario taking the bigger load, uh, but we haven't had any requests uh, to take patients from Manitoba, to, to my knowledge. Uh, so today, we currently only have one person uh, being cared for in Saskatchewan's ICU. Do you have a follow-up question, Julia? No, that answers my question. Thank you. Okay, and we'll go to Adam Hunter with CBC. 
Uh, I'd just like a bit more info on, I know you spoke to a minister about targeting schools, uh, universities, newcomer populations. What sort of plans are out there to hit uh, 30 and 40, the 30 and 40 age group, maybe 30s to, to 50s, you mentioned, these are people that are working. Obviously they have uh, probably young children, uh, kids that can't be vaccinated yet. So I would suggest they're probably an important population to get the numbers up. What are some of the strategies that we're looking at to get the, the 30 to 50s uh, with a higher percentage of first doses, uh, anyone can can take this. Uh, thanks, Adam. Uh, uh, many strategies. Obviously, the ease of our multiple vaccine clinics having it in the pharmacies, um, communication out by the SHA, by the Premier's office, uh, by the government of Saskatchewan, uh, any mechanism to be able to touch these groups. We've offered that. Uh, three hours, and I want to remind people that that is still accessible to them, uh, that they do have three hours off to go get their first shot, and that's critically important that they sit down, talk to their employer, and uh, make sure that that is available to them to be able to do that, understanding that um, which is a good thing. We have uh, sports activities starting back up. We have summer activities. We have many things that we're doing out in our yard and around uh, being able to visit our neighbors for the first time. But we have to make sure that we have that critical first shot. So we are working with new Canadians. Uh, we are working with the universities. We're trying to network out uh, to make sure that anybody in that age demographic is, which is really 40 and uh, under, has the opportunity and understands how important this is to them to be able to make sure that they get that shot again, not just for themselves, uh, but for their family and for their community and uh, just to make sure that they can get in. We're trying to do everything that we can. We're encouraging them on a daily basis to get out, get their shot, take uh, 10 minutes uh, to an hour and go get their shot, book your appointment and uh, get in, get out and uh, get vaccinated. Dr. Schaub, did you have anything to add on the targeting the under 30s? Yeah, no, I think, you know, uh, like Mr. Merriman said, uh, lots of initiatives currently happening. Um, obviously, once the bulk of the immunizations are done, um, vaccines will be available through July and August. And obviously, um, you know, it's likely that for international travel, you require two doses. Um, and but again, you know, while vaccines will be available through July, August, I think we need to recognize that we talk about incentives, but we also should talk about the immense privilege we have as Canadians and residents of Saskatchewan. We're one of the few countries in the world where vaccine is available widely for 12 and older. And uh, obviously, initially, healthcare workers, people who are older are vaccinated, but now it's available to everyone. Uh, very few countries uh, in the world uh, have this privilege. So I think we owe it to ourselves to you know, get vaccinated, protect ourselves, our family and communities, as quickly as we can and then you know Canada needs to join other countries who are privileged to help the rest of the world get vaccinated because I think till such time that uh, the world is vaccinated the pandemic globally will not end but we have an opportunity to basically end the pandemic the worst aspects of the pandemic as early as July and why would not why wouldn't we take it we talked about all the pressures on healthcare staff on or on all of us teachers um, you know, everyone working on the front lines was under pressure, worried about their own health, the health of the family, and the economic, social impacts of lockdowns. So why wouldn't we take advantage of widely available vaccines, first dose and second dose? And obviously, you know, right in the beginning, uh, teams went out to assist vaccinating uh, individuals who had, were, you know, elderly and, 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 and uh, not easily able to come to vaccination centers. So those focused initiatives will continue throughout the province in a in a in a you know culturally contextualized way. But for the vast majority of us, I think you know we need to address any complacency we have and get vaccinated as quickly as we can because I think this privilege has been afforded to very few uh, countries in the world. Thank you, Adam. Do you have a follow-up question? Yes. Uh I was wondering what what are going to be the uh, requirements for someone who's fully vaccinated to be able to um, if they if they if they do have a, become a close contact of someone are they going to have to isolate how is that going to work I, I don't know if I've heard a, an answer on that or a, a policy maybe maybe we have announced that already but what's uh, the maybe this is seen as an incentive too but uh, what can we 
do if we're fully vaccinated and we are a close contact of someone who contracts COVID? Uh, thanks, Adam. It's a, it's a great question. We just actually discussed this this morning at our public health briefing. It's something that we're currently looking at, and we're hoping to make an announcement in the near future on this. Uh, we understand that people that are fully vaccinated, uh, they, they, um, they have obviously a way less chance of contracting COVID uh, and obviously being a close contact. It's something that uh, I'm hopeful that we will announce uh, either later on this week or early next week as to of what we need to do once you are fully vaccinated. And again, if that's an incentive for people to get out and get vaccinated, then that's great. Uh, again, it's another another step back towards, uh, or another step down our roadmap to be able to get uh, back to normal. Perfect, thank you everyone for taking the time to join us today. That concludes our availability. Thank you.